So gastrocnemius injuries are incredibly common and in soccer alone they are said to make up 12% of all muscle injuries within the sport. So it's really important that we know how to assess them and treatment. If that's what you want to find out, let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So as we said in the intro, gastrocnemius injuries are incredibly prevalent not only in professional sport but amateur sport as well. Now, Noseworthy, Bolta and Alfonsi noted in 2003 that the gastrocnemius muscle is made up of a high density of type 2 fast twitch fibres and also that the muscle fatigues easily. And for me, this kind of demonstrates a big reason as to why it gets injured so much. We commonly see gastroc injuries occur during those explosive speed-based movements and when you're asking a muscle that fatigues easily to replicate those movements time and time again throughout a sporting match or a game, it's no surprise that it gets injured easily. So now let's quickly dive into some anatomy about the gastroc. So the calf complex has three main components. The gastrocnemius muscle, the biggest and most superficial of the three, alongside the deeper soleus muscle, as well as the plantaris muscle. So the gastrocnemius has two heads, a medial head and a lateral head. We can see that the medial head attaches to the posterior portion of the medial femoral condyle and the lateral head attaches to the posterior part of the lateral femoral condyle. Now we can see that the gastrocnemius inserts into the calcaneus or the heel bone via the Achilles or calcaneal tendon. So out of the two, the medial head and the lateral head, we tend to see more injuries at the medial head. Now Hsu and Chang in 2021 highlighted that this could be because there is more muscular activity at the medial head than the lateral head. And Sabulka et al. in 2017 also highlighted that when the foot is in an everted or toe out position, which we see a lot in day to day activity, the medial head is more active than the lateral head. So that could be why we see that prevalence in our injuries. So what are the causes of gastrocnemius injuries? Well, we can separate them perhaps into gradual onset and sudden onset. Now in terms of gradual onset, the key function of the gastrocnemius muscle is plantar flexion, and therefore it's no surprise that we see these injuries in runners and I think a common story that I hear in clinic is runners who have suddenly increased their training ahead of a big long distance event and therefore they've strained their gastrocnemius because they've been working it too hard. Now in terms of the sudden onsets the gastrocnemius muscle as we saw in the anatomy crosses both the knee joint and the ankle joint. This makes it what we call a biarthrodial muscle and means that there's lots of lengthening eccentric contractions that occur when it's on a full stretch. So here we might be thinking about those sudden acceleration or explosive movements, those powerful movements. So we might be thinking of jumping activities such as basketball, netball, or something like the high jump or the long jump, but also sprinters. Remember that there's lots of plantar flexion involved and it's at such a fast pace that it's no surprise that gastrocnemius muscle gets injured. Now, we talked about that heavy eccentric lengthening and sometimes you'll find that if there's such a significant amount of eccentric lengthening, not only can the gastrocnemius get injured, but the Achilles tendon can also tear as well. And here you can see injuries sustained to players like Kevin Durant, where you can see his Achilles tears. And the key impact there is that heavy eccentric lengthening when the knee might be in extension, but crucially when the ankle is in dorsiflexion. So listen out for that in your mechanisms of injury. So on to assessment, starting with signs and symptoms in the subject of history. So most commonly, you'll find that patients will point towards their calf or perhaps the musculotendinous junction with the Achilles tendon as the main area that they're experiencing their pain. Now, if there was a very sudden onset, you might listen out for whether there was some bruising or sometimes patients can describe a very sharp, intense pain as if they've been shot in the leg as the symptom or the experience that they felt when they injured their gastrocnemius. So in that gradual onset, that common theme we mentioned may be around runners. So listen out for some clues in the story and particularly it may focus around their running training. So we mentioned before about a sudden increase in training before a big event. So how quickly have they progressed their running? For example, have they gone from one mile to two mile to three miles to four miles or did they suddenly jump from one to four? That may 
clearly lead you in a direction that the gastrocnemius has been overworked. But also things like how much experience do they have running? Have they done lots of strength training before trying to increase their training? Or is this just a sudden let's go for it situation? So there's lots of clues that you might find in there. So onto the objective examination. Once again, classic signs first of all, likely to have pain on palpation of the calf muscle belly, or perhaps at the musculotendinous junction with the Achilles tendon. As we said, if they've had a particular trauma, look out for signs of swelling or bruising or perhaps warmth in the area. And the other key thing we need to do if there has been an acute trauma is to rule out an Achilles tendon rupture. One way we can do this is by completing the squeeze or Thompson test, as you can see on the screen now. And in this test, we're effectively squeezing the calf muscle belly with our patient in prone to see if it plantar flexes the ankle. And if the Achilles tendon is intact, it should therefore plantar flex the ankle. If it doesn't, that may tell you that that connection between the muscle, the tendon and the calcaneus bone has been disrupted and therefore may indicate an Achilles rupture. So other simple things, you may well find pain or reduced range of movement on passive dorsiflexion of the ankle because of course that's going to stretch that gastrocnemius muscle. And you may find pain on active plantar flexion but it's more likely that you'll find pain on resisted plantar flexion where we're asking that gastrocnemius muscle to reproduce the contraction that may have injured it in the first place. Now, the other thing that you can do as a little bit of an outcome measure to try and track your patient's progress over time is something simple like how many single leg heel raises can they do in a minute? Now, obviously at the start, this might be very difficult and you may not choose to do the test at all. But later down the line, you may well be aiming for something like 25 single leg heel raises in a minute to demonstrate that your patient has recovered really well from their injury. So on to treatment. And there's no surprise that plantar flexion is going to be a key component of rehabilitation for the gastrocnemius muscle. Now, in the early stages, I tend to focus on things like isometric holds of plantar flexion. You can either do this by asking your patient to hold onto a belt and then push their foot forward into the belt, or you can ask them to sit on the floor or on a bed with their foot against the wall and then plantar flex hold into the wall. I tend to go for five repetitions of perhaps 10 to 15 second holds two to three times a day. And you can progress from there into some sitting heel raises. And heel raises or calf raises are going to be a major component of the different stages. And you can always start in a seated position. So this will simply be sitting down in a chair, feet on the floor, and then simply pushing up onto the toes in order to do plantar flexion. Now you can also progress your sitting heel raises. You can start with the hands on the thighs, which will mean that there's less body weight going through the calf muscle. Then you can progress this by putting the hands onto the knees, increasing body weight through the calf muscle. Then you can put your elbows on your knees. Again, increase body weight through the muscle. And if you really want to, you can even go on to single leg plantar flexion heel raises in that sitting position. So how about repetitions? I'm aiming for my patient to be able to get up to 15 repetitions two to three times a day. But it may well be that in the early stages, you have to strip that right down to only a couple of repetitions if they're very, very sore. So on to the middle stages, you could progress your isometrics by using a heavy resistance band for your patient to do that plant flexion movement. Once again, you can do five repetitions of 10 to 15 second holds. But the key exercise that you'll see being progressed in this middle stage is your standing heel raise or your standing calf raise exercise. So you can start with a double leg and quite simply, you're asking your patient to push up onto their toes before returning back down. You can always start with something like six to eight repetitions, but I really wanna be working my patient up towards 12 to 15, perhaps even more repetitions over time. Now you can also progress your double leg heel raises. For example, they can start with both feet in the middle and then they can gradually move the unaffected leg out to the side so that it puts more weight on the affected leg. You can also progress this to a single leg heel raise in time. And you can also progress it by asking your patient to start with their heels on a flat surface or even on a step, but with the heels only coming down to the midline. And then over time, asking them to drop their heels into a dorsiflexion position at the ankle 
as they do the repetitions because that's going to encourage that eccentric contraction as we saw that's really important in the mechanism of injury. Okay, so on to the late stages of rehab. And here I'm really thinking about that speed-based activity, those explosive activities, and of course that heavy eccentric lengthening because all of these play a major role in the mechanism of injury as we spoke about earlier. And I also might be asking my patient to do these exercises every other day because of the high explosive force nature of the exercises. So some exercises that we can use to really incorporate those principles. Well one that I like to do is a sprint off. Here we simply ask our patient to adopt that sprinter's pose as if their foot was in the blocks and then we're asking them to really push off, really incorporate that heavy explosive plantar flexion based movement. I might aim for six to eight repetitions here with two sets. And we can also incorporate that explosive speed-based movement into our calf raises. So one thing you can do here is asking your patient to do a single leg calf raise off a step, ask them to engage in the concentric movement, ask them to then lower themselves into the eccentric movement and then suddenly jump and push themselves up for that explosivity. And the idea is that you're combining concentric eccentric sudden explosive jump to make sure that that plantar flexion is getting the full range of contractile movement but also that explosive movement as well once again six to eight reps two sets so thanks so much for watching guys if you want even more from us links in the description below for our website clinicalphysio.com and social media such as our instagram account at clinical physio my name's khalid thank you so much for watching see you really soon here on clinical physio